Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee, the 28th of March. Uh, first of all, got apologies um, received from Councillor Greatrex, Councillor Kingston, Councillor Jones, and we've got apologies from uh, the portfolio holders, uh, Councillor Doyle and Councillor Pritchard. Uh, just remind all members that uh, the meeting is being recorded and can be viewed on YouTube. Uh, agenda item number two, minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, could I ask for somebody to move and second these? Yeah. Um, uh, all in favour? Yeah. Uh, agenda item number three, declarations of interest. Has anybody got any declarations they need to declare for this evening's meeting? No. Uh, Agenda item number four, update from the chair. Um, so, maybe a date for people's diaries. There's an open meeting for the Integrated Care Partnership Strategy, which is on uh, Wednesday the 17th of May, uh, 1 to, uh, sorry, 1 till 3, uh, and you can register via a link, which I'll get sent around uh, after the meeting. Um, I'd just like to make members aware that um, from a couple of meetings ago, or it might have been last meeting, that um, we had one of the officers speaking about the Staffordshire Connects uh, website, and the committee asked if that could be incorporated into Tamworth's Bor uh, Borough Council's website, uh, which has now been uh, added, uh, and that can be found within the community page of the council's website. Uh, again, I'll get a link shared round just so everybody isn't aware where that is. Um, I did speak the other week about the breast screening that had been taking place, uh, but I've had a, a concern raised by a member from the committee. Um, but after this, I'll speak to uh, County Councillor Jay to see if he could pick that up as it's a, a county-wide um, not so much issue, but but, but policy, uh, and I don't think it's for this committee. Um, General item number five, uh, responses to reports of the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee, uh, none as yet. Uh, General item number six, consideration of matters referred to Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee from Cabinet or Council. Um, There is one uh, which is being picked up tonight, and that's around public toilets in Tamworth, uh, which hopefully we'll have some, some outcomes from the end of this meeting. Uh, agenda item number seven, update on health-related matters considered by Staffordshire County Council. Um, there has been the written updates circulated uh, around members, but I was just wondering if uh, Councillor Jai wanted to add any input from the meetings at all. Which one was that, sorry? Uh, the county meetings of the 13th of February and 20th of March. Yep. Um, so there's two, two key items, really. One, one you've covered earlier. You mentioned there's going to be a session on it anyway, which is the uh, Staffordshire and Stoke on Trent ICB um, operational plan, so I won't go into that. The other one was just around social care workforce in general. That continues to be an issue, not just in Staffordshire, but across the country. Um, forecasts show that we need just over 6,000 new staff to meet current needs across Staffordshire um, and that inc we need an additional 16,000 by 2027 on top of that 6,000. So it's quite a challenge there. Um, retention of staff has deteriorated slightly since reopening following the pandemic. Mainly it seems because there are more opportunities in other sectors than there were before. So that's exacerbating it and uh, the county looking at rewards and uh, awards and benefits to retain staff as much as they can, but um, pay still poses a challenge in Staffordshire and nationally. So a big challenge ahead, um, but the county's trying to do what it can to, to in increase the workforce. Uh, any members got any questions in relation to that at all? No. 
So agenda item number eight, uh, we've got safeguarding children and adults at risk of abuse report. Uh, that's for the dates October 22 to March 23. Uh, this is the second annual report of this committee, which this committee receives. Um, in attendance, we've got the portfolio holder, Councillor Summers, uh, officers Joe Sands, uh, who is Assistant Director Partnerships. You've got Jackie Hodkinson, Children and Family Safeguarding Officer, and Lisa Hall, uh, Safe Communities and Homes Manager. Uh, I'd just like to hand over to officers, but first of all, uh, Portfolio Holder, Councillor Summers. Thank you, Chair. I've got quite the team here tonight. Um, but uh, I'm going to hand over straight over to Jackie, Chair, because she's the expert and I'm not. Thank you. Um, the report itself is quite explanatory of what, what the information is that we do in regards to safeguarding um, as a council as a whole. Um, you can see that the referrals have gone up quite rapidly in regards to adult referrals. Um, since the report was obviously put into play, we've not come to the end of the quarter yet, so our figures have gone up slightly. For children, we've now got eight um, safeguarding referrals for this quarter, and for adults, we've also got eight referrals that come through. Predominantly, a lot of the referrals do come from um, TBC staff, mainly our housing staff are our main referrals. Um, miscellaneous, as it states, are basically concerns that have come through, usually through... Um, emails that come through to our customer services representatives about concerns about something that may have happened. It may be relating to antisocial behaviour, it may be domestic abuse, it may be safeguarding. Um, it's quite difficult because we don't have a lot of information to go on. So it's about finding out basically the area, the concern, the worry and whether they're known or not. We're very lucky because we have got fantastic partnership working in Tamworth and we have got our daily briefings now which is mentioned on the report. They run every Monday and Thursday mornings. We have great representation from a range of organisations and professionals from voluntary and um, health and um, police, obviously our own housing teams as well. Um, community sectors play a big part in that as well. So anybody can bring any concerns, any worries. It doesn't have to be safeguarding. It can be any aspects of vulnerability, health and safety that we can discuss and obviously look at a plan forward. As a result of those discussions, sometimes, yes, they lead into safeguarding inquiries. They may potentially go to our Tamworth Vulnerability Partnership meeting for a more in-depth discussion about who knows the family or the, uh, the person of interest or the concern or the worry. Or it may be that we refer on to um, a community support, such as Communities Together. It may be mental health support that they need. Um, again, it all depends on what, what the concern, the worry is. Sometimes it may need a more rapid discussion and more action taking, which TVB can't always meet. So then we look at professionals meetings. So we will look at calling together a group of professionals, look at the best outcome and support for those individuals and obviously helping them the best way we can to engage with services. So a lot of that information is in, within the report that's been put forward. Um, the safeguarding policy has been updated to reflect changes that have gone on nationally and also locally within Staffordshire. So one of the biggest changes for us in Staffordshire is within children's services. We no longer have first response. Now it is now Staffordshire Children's Advice and Support Service. So obviously the contact telephone numbers and referral routes have changed slightly. So that's been updated and reflected in our training and also in our policies and our briefings with our staff members as well. I've had a fantastic response from um, training with staff members coming on board and accessing training. The suicide training has been very well um, received by all staff members. There's lots of different avenues for that. There's a 20 minute um, briefing that staff can do and there's also further training that's relevant to staff members' roles and responsibilities. Taxi driver training. Again, we've had another fantastic response with our taxi drivers. Um, we've trained well over 150 drivers in regards to safeguarding child exploitation trafficking and modern slavery and we're looking to roll out our online package which will be um, obviously overseeing and making sure it does meet everything that we we cover in a face-to-face -face, um, session that we do and um, we are starting to go back to face-to-face -face training now as well and child protection conferences as from april will start to go back to face-to-face -face as well because we realize the importance of having that professional approach working and networking with our colleagues as well and we are very active with our children and adult safeguarding boards and partnerships as well so any questions uh thank you very much uh, councillor woodruff 
Yeah, you know when people have had the, um, say like the suicide training, is the support afterwards because some people it can affect them emotionally and mentally? Yeah, absolutely. So obviously there's a health warning that comes with any training that we deliver because it does have um, an effect and it can open up old wounds and bring things into play for people. So we do a lot of signposting and obviously we do say to them if there is an area that you feel quite difficult that we're going to discuss then we will break out and we'll come back but please do not go away without having a conversation with the trainer. And then um, we do do um, every three months we send out questionnaires to staff members that have been part of the training to make sure that they're happy if there's anything else that they'd like to cover as a result of that. Sorry, you know you were talking about safeguarding and yeah. stuff. Do you hold, you know, you've got your ladder and you, you organise out in bodies like that. Do you hold regular side positions of trust meetings to make sure that things on top of the other meetings that you have? We don't because we haven't, touch wood, I'm going to say this, we haven't had any concerns about any of our staff members who are in a position of trust that have breached that trust right. as a result of it. But anything that would come to light, then the ladder would automatically contact us directly to have those conversations and we would put those, um, obviously, mechanisms and support in place and we work quite closely oh, with really? our ladder. Oh, that's good, that's good, that's great, thank you. Uh, anybody else? Uh, Council Cook. Oh uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm actually kind of glad we're actually on this other topic as well. Um, I was having a chat with a person over um, a couple of nights ago. Um, this person's got. Um, a, Friend, to health issues, etc., and he, he said over last week in, um, on a chat that almost every person he's contacted about it, they've got this extra bit of a uh, 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 the list which saves it. You got to wait on. Um, in his kind of case, it's half a year, and obviously that is not uh, that isn't a force. That's some sort of uh, charities, etc. Um, if we ever have a person that's in that much of a um, dark area have we got the actual resources to um to help them almost instantly almost we, we have crisis yeah. so there are crisis supports that we can go to but obviously each case is going to be taken on its merits yeah, depending yeah. on what the concern the worry is in regards to that and we can only do as much as what the information that we're given and the problem that we have with a lot of our adults is around, obviously, them wanting to engage mm. in services as well. So a lot of the problems that we have is that we will get an adult to engage with a service, but then they'll back away. And a lot of the things that we're getting told from mental health is that their DNA in appointments, they're declining appointments, they're not available. So that's taken a lot of their time because they're trying to obviously put the appointments in place. They realise there is a massive backlog mm. of support available to them. But if you've got people that are constantly DNA and not turning up, then obviously that has a knock-on effect then for other people who are trying to access those services of support. And unfortunately, we haven't got staff who can handheld and take to appointments. So it's about, you know, working better with our community groups and looking at other avenues of support. So a lot of things that we try to do is the social aspect with a lot of these people, because a lot of them just want to be friending. So if they want to go somewhere, they want to have a cup of tea, they just want to have a chat, and then eventually that might open up and they might start to trust that volunteer or that agency to then access support services. So it's about working and educating our mental health colleagues, our social workers, our social practitioners, all about the support that we've got in our localities that we work within and who they can signpost to, and then get them on board to work with those groups of people and eventually hopefully they will open up and start to engage with those services and know that you know we're there to help them that's what we want to do we want to achieve a way of making them feel better but supporting them 
around the issues that they've got as well. A lot of people don't think they've got a problem as well. They don't, you know, we have, we have a lot of issues where, you know, it's not my fault. This has happened because of X, Y, and Z. You know, you need to be doing more as a council to help and support me. You know, and it's really difficult. Um, some of the cases that we deal with, we've got one in particular where the gentleman that we're working with is very angry because we're making him fill applications out. We're making him do that. But we can't be seen to be sitting there and writing everybody's housing applications out, you know, going along to appointments with them. It, we haven't got the staffing to do that. It's not for us to do that. You know, they have to make their own decisions in their own right. So it's around that support mechanism is what we're trying to do and signpost to those services of support available to them. And like I said, each case is going to be taken on its merits depending on what information we're giving and what we know about that person. I've just got a few questions. Um, hopefully not too complicated. Um, so first one is, um, just it, the report refers to um, who the referrals come from. Is that a fairly even split of staff or is it, yeah. is it concentrated in a particular area? Like I said, the majority comes from housing. So our tenancy sustainment officers who are going out and working directly with, with those individuals who are going out to the properties. Um, we get, we, we've started to get, which is a, which is a positive, um, our contractors, so weights and equons that we've been working with really closely. So it's a, we're doing a big piece of work with them at the moment mm -hmm. because they are the eyes and ears. They're going out there doing a lot of repairs on the properties. And when I've had meetings with them in the past, they're like, well, it wasn't really safeguarding, so I've not referred it, but it's still health and safety which could have a knock-on effect for vulnerability and potentially leading to safeguarding. So we're doing more work around with, with our contractors to highlight, you know, if you've gone into a bit of a dirty property or you've got somebody who's hoarding or somebody who's refusing to answer the door, why are they doing that? You know, what's going on? Are they embarrassed about something? Have they got a need? They don't know who to talk to. So we're working better and trying to engage better with our contractors around picking those up as well. Um, and the other one was, um, on the graphs, um, on 23 and 24 of the report, yeah, what yeah. is the difference between um, the two on both pages? Yeah, got... so what you've got is, these are the number of concerns that have been brought in. So, as you can see, if you, as you look at the graph, you've got, um, at the top, you've got 15 children referrals for 2022-23. And then you've got 32 adult referrals. As you go down, it tells you how many of them have actually gone on to another agency. So, so out that... of the 15 children, 15 referred into okay. children's yeah. services. Out of the 32 adult referrals, only 27 hit the threshold for referral to go in because they were deemed not safeguarding related. So they didn't yeah. go to safeguarding. That's not to say that they weren't dealt with. It was to say that they didn't hit the threshold for a safeguarding referral to go in. Thank you. Services. Thank you. Um, I've just got a couple of them. I mean, you, you, you've answered one really. I think it's just a typo in the report because you've still got energy yes. uh, as opposed to Equons. They, uh, they are, yeah. They were energy, but they've gone over yeah. to Equons, yeah. Um, and in terms of the, the graphs, yeah. I mean, obviously, that trend to me, although we're still uh, awaiting the final quarter from this year is going on a downward downward trend year to year, uh, fluctuating up and down through quarters to quarters. But I personally want to see the two years prior to COVID, possibly next year, because uh, there was a lot of talk in the in in the press about how COVID um, affected safeguarding uh, and, and that maybe agencies weren't seeing. Uh, the presentations because of, of nobody being about, nobody being at work, kids not being at school. So it's if that trend has continued from before COVID mm -hmm. or, or, or if we're, there was, like say, I'm, I'm only assuming now yes, because I can't, I can't see the results. But I mean, if, if next year, the, the, maybe the two years prior, that then, then for me, it'd, it'd give a better indication of the trend. Um, and the final one was uh, taxis. Is that a requirement of licensing or, or is it just offered to them? It's actually an requirement that came into play as a result of um, child sexual exploitation cases, as a result of Rochdale and Rotherham.
cases, so it was made mandatory that all um, taxi licensed drivers have to do safeguarding awareness around child exploitation and trafficking. Brilliant. Uh, and, well, not, not brilliant, but, but yeah. good that it's a, it's a, requ <laughs> it's a requirement. Um, anybody else? Okie dokie. Um, um, so the recommendation was to review the report and uh, just like a mover and a seconder if possible, please. Did you say it? Yeah, Chris. Uh, and I'd like to thank the portfolio holder and officers for attending. Do you want a quick vote? Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, all in favour? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, uh, thank you to uh, portfolio holder and officers and for the report and their comments. Thank you. Okay, uh, item number nine is the King's Coronation Weekend Plans. Uh, just like to welcome... A.D. Ramsell, uh, the Theatre Artistic and Events Manager, to provide a uh, brief update. Thank you, Mr Chair. So the coronation weekend, um, 5th to the 8th of May this year, is a joint project between arts and events and sports. Now, what we've had to um, do when planning this is be mindful of the fact that the King Charles coronation is a stripped-back version to reflect the current economic climate and... Um, King Charles's general attitude towards favouring sustainability and back to basics. Therefore, we felt we cannot go down the extravagant and generally over-the-top event style. What we have done is base the event on free and accessible community engagement, children and the bringing together of charities and community. So it all kicks off on Friday the 5th of May. In the assembly rooms, we're having a silver screen showing the King's speech. Um, you'll, you'll see the connection there. And that will be followed by a coronation lunch. We have put a request in that the mayor is going to act as a host for that. The event is limited to 170 attendees. 100 tickets will be given away to eight charities. Um, these people will be moved into the Saxon suite after the film for lunch that, again, the mayor will host. 70 tickets will be sold as normal. Um, over in the bandstand, in the, on the afternoon of Friday from 2 till 4, there is a bandstand performance. And from 2 o'clock, um, cream tea boxes will be available to purchase on site. They'll need to be pre-ordered from the Claymore Suite and a limited number will be available to purchase. What we are doing is purchasing up to 10 wooden picnic benches for people to sit on, enjoy their lunch on, that we will look to get engraved with a coronation <coughs> message. And these will act as a legacy for future outdoor events to commemorate the coronation of the King. That evening in the assembly rooms, there will be another screening, a coronation cinema screening, 198 seats for sale and the full cinema food offer will be available then. Saturday the 6th of May in the Castle Grounds, Saturday and Sunday both follow relatively the same pattern. Um, between 10 o'clock and 6 o'clock, exact times are still to be arranged, we will have free sports events organised by um, the sports development team, such as we've got the two kilometre run, the five kilometre royal fun runs, the piggyback races, which proved popular in the Summerfest last year, tug of war and sports department are going to organise activities throughout the day in the castle grounds. In the main arena, um, for those who remember the Summerfest last year, we had the world's largest inflatable. This year we've got the Realm, which is a large, it, it's the largest inflatable castle. So we've got that down there for the whole weekend. Um, tickets for that will go on sale, and that is for children up to 12 years of age. And as part of that, that will be available from 11 till 6 every day. But as part of that, we're offering relaxed sessions with a lower capacity. Running alongside that, we have Hamster Zorb, which is the outdoor inflatables, but that is for children over 12. Um, and again, that will be ticketed throughout the weekends. 11 till 6 p.m. every day, we have the performance tent. And this is a program of outdoor theater, storytelling, magicians, face painting workshops, balloon modeling, puppetry theater. 
that runs both days in a series of programs completely free entry to the whole community no ticketing just turn up whatever you want to watch in the program as part of that we're purchasing a performance throne which is a large wooden outdoor throne from where the storytellers can tell their stories and perform again this is going to be engraved with the tamworth coat of arms and a king's coronation plaque and that will be a legacy to be used at future outdoor events catering vendors and picnic tables again will be available throughout the weekend on the saturday the bandstand from 12 till 3 will be Ammonton brass band performance the reason we've gone for the brass band on the saturday is that we've got the masonic dinner at the assembly rooms that was booked in a year ago and they will unfortunately take all our tech capability so Ammonton brass band are the bandstand on the saturday on the sunday the same program except it's the big national lunch the big lunch on the upper and lower lawns from 12 till 4 where again we'll have food vendors and walkabout characters and the bandstand providing live free music we've got a full bandstand schedule from 12 o'clock till 4 30 in the afternoon on the evening of sunday there's a we're screening the concert at windsor castle into the assembly rooms and what we're doing is inviting 120 charity workers and volunteers to attend a party night style screening of the concert and we'll do a nomination call out for the charities for that and we as part of that we provide a two course dinner and a dj compare is included for the evening now in and around the whole weekend we've got the following arts development and outreach programs happening we've got children's art competitions short story competitions photo opportunities we've got design a coronation cake where the win the winning cake is to be baked and served in the claymore cafe or coronation week if it's any good we'll carry on baking it snowdown and namco have been approached to bring their sports offers into the grounds and we've got beef eaters henry the eighth queen victoria and king charles ii walkabouts monday the 8th of may nationally is earmarked as the big help out day now we've gone into long discussions about this whether the community will come out in force on a bank holiday to volunteer so the decision has been made to promote local charities and causes throughout the weekend giving these groups space within the previous three days for them to market themselves and promote and encourage membership and volunteering we will do as much as we can to promote all groups and charities who raise their hands to be a part of the weekend so the whole program is very much aimed at bringing the community in we do have some ticketed events but the biggest part of the saturday and sunday is the performance tent which is seven hours of non-stop theater performance workshops for the entire family thank you very much anybody got any questions or comments um i might have missed it because it's a brilliant spread that, that you're putting on there but is there actually is the the current coronation itself being presented anywhere it isn't because the cost of that would have been twenty thousand pounds and we thought who who will come out and justify that cost and so we're putting the money into providing free events for the community who do, do come down and i believe there are there are various um venues pubs clubs that are screening it anyway okay. uh, yeah brilliant answer uh money's better spent on on events log, log you're putting out uh council climber thank you chair thank you Abby. that all sounds fantastic um as we did with the summer things last year are we going to have i mean we're talking about toilets later are we bringing in extra toilet facilities for these yes as with all the traditional outdoor events that we do extra security and toilets and catering provisions will be brought in yeah thank you Jay. uh anybody else um j just around um communications uh, what sort of communication strategy are you, are you putting out to, to get this out to the communities um some comms has gone out already but from tomorrow morning that's when the full scale marketing plan goes out the obviously ticket events goes on sale it goes across social media it goes all to the tamworth herald tomorrow and the birmingham mail local newspapers and we're hoping to get on the local news as well for it because again i think tamworth is going to be the biggest lo the local authority with the biggest celebration of this kind just like we were last year for the commonwealth games 
Yeah, br brilliant. I mean, it, it's a thing that we really do well in Tamworth is events. Uh, and it sounds like we're going to put a, another brilliant one on on there. Uh, just one more. It's a shame that Joe, Joe's gone, but um, are you using Joe's uh, contacts to get out to the charities uh, for the, the, the events that you're holding in the assembly rooms? Yes, the call's going to go out to Cabinet and the Assistant Directors and Directors to do a nomination call for the charities. So we're very much, we're not sitting down and just picking the charities. It's going to, first of all, go to Cabinet and who are the most, you know, the celebrated charities, who are the most worthy charities to bring. And that's why we've split it into the Friday. Uh, the charities can invite um, the participants of the charities the Sunday is the charity workers and volunteers, so both sides of a charity can actually be rewarded. Uh, anybody? Anything else? Uh, so, yeah, I'd like to th thank you for attending and uh, look forward to all the events. Thank you. Uh, to go uh, item number 10 is the indoor and outdoor sports strategy um, we're to receive an update on the playing pitch and outdoor sports strategy and the indoor built facility strategy being undertaken by Knight and Kavanagh and Page um, in attendance are the executive directors uh, organisation and Karen Moss uh, sports development manager uh, and yeah uh, hand over to officers thank you Thank you, Chair. Um, the, the main reason for coming today is to obviously give an update on the playing pitch and the outdoor sports strategy and the indoor uh, and built for, uh, facilities strategy. As you've rightly said, is currently being done by external consultants, Knight, Caver and Page. Um, the draft versions of both of those strategies have only just been received by officers. Um, and after initial appraisal, some of the areas in the document we feel need to be amended and some looked at in, in greater depth. Um, for example, there are some perceived gaps um, around provision that is in within close proximity to Tamworth, so that, that borders with uh, North Warwickshire and that borders with, with Lichfield. Um, so we've asked for some of, uh, of those, those clubs that train and um, uh, over the borough, but uh, predominantly for Tamworth residents to be included in, in the strategy. Uh, and with regards to the new uh, leisure centre, uh, that was part of the Gungate development. Um, we've had the, the first lot of feedback towards that, but again, we're going back for some amendments and some clarification on that. Um, it, at the moment, it suggests that we don't need a full complement of a traditional uh, leisure facility uh, and that a dry side provision um, would be appropriate. Um, but it is felt that the town centre might not be the best location for that. So we've asked consultants to go out and to have a look at some alternative um, <laughs> some alternative uh, provision alternative locations um, but also with the kind of input of, of Eugene uh, we've now you know going along the the idea of looking at the the idea of looking at a, a, a big a traditional le leisure facility with encompassing kind of wet and dry facilities with the idea that you know that we've got pool tanks that are part of community use that have been included in the strategy that are due for end of life um particularly the likes that kind of down, down at belgrave um even though wilnicott and, and quem's pools have had a bit of an upgrade uh, but they are near end of life which will potentially in the next five to seven years have a huge impact on our water space provision so then at that point we may need to look at build, building a new leisure facility um, so that's certainly not ruled out of the the equation um, but the, the the adaptions and some of the potential changes that we've asked for to be looked at by uh, Knight, Kavanagh and Page uh, could potentially change some of the the outcomes um, none of the the strategy findings so far have been discussed with any elected members or officers and we're still analysing and digesting uh, and processing the kind of copious amounts of data held within the reports. When we do bring the full reports to, to scrutiny, you'll see exactly why that's taking you know, a while to digest. There's, there's a lot of information that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, and the final drafts of the reports are expected at the end of April. Uh, at which point we will expect to have the current amendments that we've asked for to be uh, have considered and been addressed. Um, so therefore, really, we're at, we, we've asked for a, a, a large detailed update of the strategy to have postponed uh, to the subsequent meeting after we've had the final draft reports. Brilliant. Uh, thank you. Um, 
Anybody for questions? Um, more, more than one is, is um, with COC taking on the, the wellbeing strategy, um, or, or, or if you're feeding either way with, with, with these two strategies, because I think that uh, indoor and outdoor <coughs> sports and the facilities that we've got are a big link with, with wellbeing uh, and health, and I think it, it'd be beneficial um, that one sort of doesn't be constructed without input from the other. Um, so, so that that was my uh, main concern. Um, in in terms of timeline, you said that the drafts will be done by April. Would you be looking at something say late summer to to come back to scrutiny? Yeah, I think we're talking kind of you know post June. I mean, we we've said about around the the um, the leisure centre feasibility. Originally, obviously, we looked at the Golden Gate development, and it was going to be wet and dry side. Uh, the initial findings are saying we need a sports hall that is at least four courts, um, and after discussions. Um, you know, the, there's also the possibility to look into a larger kind of dry side facility that would be um, of use for kind of more regional based competitions rather than just local need. Um, but for that, we need to send the consultants off and do a larger piece of work. So that then will potentially delay the end of April timeline. Uh, but no, I think by by kind of mid end of June, um, we'll have everything. Thank you. Um, and with regards to the well-being kind of strategy, I met with the CRC two weeks ago. So we're well, fed in initial findings um, to, to Lee Bate, to, who's putting that together. But I've also said once we get final drafts and, you know, it's gone through through Cabinet and through scrutiny, that we will share those documents as well. So uh, those can be those can be fed in. Brilliant. Uh, anybody else? Can I me? Sorry if it's already been mentioned. Um, who are the consultants and how long are they going to be consulting for, do you imagine? So the, the consultants that um, that won the tender submission, Knight, Kavner and Page, they are the market leaders for, for leisure consultancy. Um, I, I couldn't tell you exactly how long they've been going, but they are the market leaders. Uh, and if you look at other authorities around the country, they will probably do a good 80, 90 percent of the you know leisure consultant strategy um, work. Um, you know they're very well respected in, within the industry, um, you know, and, and come with a with a wealth of knowledge. Eugene might be able to in, uh, kind of elaborate a little bit more than that because Eugene has also worked with them previously, um, so has you know good knowledge of their background um, and exactly you know the working officers. Hi, uh, so I'm Eugene Minogue, <coughs> I'm an executive consultant working with with Townworth just to provide some additional support in and around this and. Other areas, so KKP or Knight Kavanagh and Page uh, will predominantly be working to supporting and guidance. So it's called ANOG guidance um, or assessing need and opportunities guidance. So it's quite a stringent process. It feeds into the national planning policy framework. Um, it will link very heavily and support um, the local plan as well. So we need to make sure that these documents are positioned correctly and make sure that they speak holistically across a number of bits and bits and pieces, not just internally, but also externally as well. Um, linking back to the point around uh, health and well-being, uh, one of the additional pieces of work that um, I've recommended that KKP can take on is called an SOPM or an SOPG, whichever one you want to call it, and that stands for Strategic Outcomes Planning Guidance or Model. And the idea being is once you've got the statutory uh, indoor and outdoor facilities strategy, which are predominantly planning based documents, it knits that into things like the health and well-being and making sure that any facilities that are provided are rooted in local strategic outcomes, making sure that we're hitting the health and well-being of, of residents for Tamworth, but also in the surrounding areas as well. It will also cover more broader things around sustainable operating models and making sure that they're fit for purpose, not just now, but moving into, into the future. Um, obviously, things like integrated care boards is relatively new um, as well, so we need to make sure that we're, we're feeding into that, that agenda as well. So it's just tweaking what we've currently got. Most of it is, is in place and the indicative findings are there, but we need to steer the consultants in um, a, not a slightly different direction, but we need to broaden the focus of what they're doing so we get more nuanced information so that members can make fully informed decisions of how you want to progress moving forwards. Yeah, sorry. Um, and what's the time frame just on this? 
So uh, as Karen's outlined, it, it, it may push it back slightly. So in terms of KKP, we had a meeting uh, early net last week um, to talk about some of the additional pieces of work or the nuanced pieces that they need to look at. So that will take things forwards, um, uh, push the timeline back, sorry, I should say. Um, one of the other pieces of work is a foundation piece of work called an FP. I'm now talking an acronym, so an FPM, a facilities planning model. So that's a bit that sort of underpins the built facilities strategy. So we had a brief meeting with uh, the consultants that look after that today. Um, the good thing is we only need them to do some additional pieces. The bulk of the work has been done, but we want to test some various different, what they call runs or scenarios within that. That will then update the built facility strategy. Um, so the piece of work that the consultants need to do on the FPM will take us to around about May time. The reason they say May, they can do the work quite early, but it's got to go through a robust quality assurance process with Sport England for them to to sign it off and then it comes back and then only then can KKB then build that into the built facility strategy. But all of this stuff will work hand in glove. Um, so it sounds like we're pushing things back, but there's a lot that can happen coterminously um, alongside each other. And these consultants are very used to, like Karen's outlined, is, is used to working with, you, with each other, very used to the process that they need to do. So for summertime, we should be able to come back with um, uh, you know the strategies in the place that we would need to be the sopm um or the strategic outcomes planning model may take a little bit longer but the main thing is you've got those those documents um in place um one more one more quick one i mean uh, for the amount of work that's going into to this this strategy I mean, uh, what's the life on it shall we say so so we are speaking seven to ten years before the, this process has got to all be started again yes yeah, so it's, it's a really good question um in terms of the longevity of it what the the document should do is tie into the length of the local plan the current local plan as far as i'm aware is 2031 but we are looking at a refresh of that so we're going to look at the longer term date for that very reason um that those documents are predominantly for planning process because sporting is a statutory quantity for various sort of elements of indoor and outdoor play provision but they're not exclusively for that um, they also inform a number of different internal policies so things like uh, the use of section 106 seal capital funding other bits and pieces so that you've got longer term view the idea being is you should you should keep them as long-term view as you can uh, there's a relatively new process um, whereby you can want for a better phrase keep them live um, through some innovative sort of dashboards and other bits and pieces because it's predominantly fed from population data from ONS and other bits and pieces. So you can do, one for a better phrase, live modelling, but that's something we can we can bring forward at a future meeting to see if that's something that members want to, want to take forwards. Um, but to answer your question, yes, it should be tied to the local plan is the short answer. Uh, anybody else? Uh, Councillor Woodrup. Yeah, just just a quick one. <clears throat> Obviously, with the cost of living crisis, I would imagine the, the the cost of this is changing week by week as well because it's in the national press, isn't it? About you know, obviously, you know, going back to swimming pools and things like that. Some are having to close, and you know, um, sports centres with the the high right, you know, the high cost of fuel and stuff. So, is that having a massive impact at the moment? In tr in short, yes. In terms of the capital build of a leisure facility, I think you're are you referring to or the audio yeah so the capital costs yes they are fluctuating and that they, that changes on a, a sort of daily basis um there are some different ways of funding that and that's something that will come out through particularly through the sopm uh process and um, so we can give members a full view of um costs and associated risks um with any capital build as as as, as we progress sort of through that process but the SOPM is, is a specific process to look at sustainable operating models as well uh, and making sure that the services and facilities that you provide are fairly priced and costed and operated on a sustainable sort of sort of model. Um, with the introduction of ICBs or integrated care boards, um, there is now a better or is becoming better understanding of the role of sport and leisure had in wider health and well-being activities, whether that's indoors or outdoors, or the bit in between the informal spaces of places, playgrounds, outdoor gyms, um, walking and cycling, active travel. These are, all have an internet interconnectivity, um, and that's essentially why the SOPM will knit all of that together, really. 
Sorry, just one more, one more thing. Do, do they also, because you know, um, obviously Staffordshire Council do the every everyday health and stuff. Have they also included that sort of team in this? Because it all runs hand in hand, doesn't it? And we don't want, you know, I know since COVID, you know, leisure centres in general have taken a massive hit, haven't they? You know, um, so I'm just wondering how that would fit in with the strategy that every that Staffordshire Council are doing with everyday health. What everyone's health. Absolutely, it's a really good point, and that that is the exact point of the SOPM process that Sport England introduced a couple of years ago. It is relatively new compared to things like the built facility strategy and the playing pit strategy. And the idea being is is, is one from breakfast to turn the telescope round to make sure that you're not developing facilities in isolation, but they're actually to meet uh, identified local strategic outcomes, and that will be predominantly. Um, dictated by health and well-being board but also things like uh, your population growth um, and then other associated things like such as crime and social behavior active travel so make sure it's all considered in the round um, as opposed to just doing what was done many years ago just doing sport for sport's sake there's much more wider benefits um, than that so, and that's essentially what the SOPM process is designed to do and then to underpin that with a sustainable operating model Great, thanks. I've been having a, having a bit, bit of a um, skirt around it, but no, it sounds good. And if it, you know, in practice, I just hope it works. Uh, anybody else? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I, I, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so I obviously uh, kind of respect that you haven't had the whole lot yet, anyway. And that um, that we um, will obviously have a chance to uh, gonna see it in respect of the extra uh, costs, etc. As well, um, we kind of go on about everyone literally sort of using the uh, facilities, etc. Anyway, have we also had a look in to the facilities that are being kind of used um, for other events as well. Uh, obviously, uh, professional sort of sporting events, etc. Thank you. Yeah, so both of these strategies, so the, the indoor and outdoor um, strategies and the SOPM, look at the the place of Tamworth and the surrounding boroughs and districts, um, regardless of how they're operated um, or whether they're in council ownership. So it looks at the stock that you've got, does it meet resident need, uh, identifies gaps and opportunities and things for the council to consider or be aware of. Um, so it looks at it holistically um, in the round, but those strategies are very much facility based. And then the SOPM brings in that more nuanced, what are the local strategic outcomes, what do we need to deliver, and what is the service provision that should be based out of those um, to make sure that we're meeting identified um, need. So it gives you that much more nuanced view as opposed to just building a leisure centre for leisure centre's sake. Um, so hopefully that will come forwards and through that process, particularly through the SOPM, a number of partners uh, will be consulted to make sure that we get get that as right as we practically can, given things, that everything is a point in time, um, <coughs> but making sure that we've got flexibility uh, moving forwards. Uh, okay, so, um, who else, sorry? Uh, Council Woodrup. Sorry, it's me again. Also, and you've probably touched on it, I think, before, but are you getting a lot of the uh, sort of tiny targeting all age groups, but getting some of the youngsters involved? I know they've got these fit to camp things for the youngsters that are going on, and I know that a lot of football clubs are signed up to, you know, and getting more girls involved in football and, you know, the rugby clubs and things like that. Is that something else that you're looking at as a wider picture to get that? You know, because that seems to be doing quite well, these little fit camps for the kids and whatever, and to get some, you know, youth centres have gone, haven't they? So there's nowhere for the kids to go. So is that something that could be, or is going to be incorporated in to help, you know, um, with this? Sorry, I'm just I'll, I'll, do, I'll do a little bit and then Karen can give the, the sort of more <coughs> localised context because I've only been in a couple of couple of weeks. But there's a sta standardised process that you have to go through through Sport England guidance 
So particularly with the outdoor playing pitch strategy, you have to consult through all the NGBs and all the localised clubs uh, within that. Um, that does take some cajaling at times to get people to engage with the process, but it, it does work. Um, and then that feeds through to the, the sort of local needs. Again, at the SOPM sort of process, that will be revisited and sort of sort of come through. Um, there's obviously been things that are introduced by the government of the day. So things like we've got <coughs> half programs or holiday activity fund uh, programs at the moment. So engaging with county and children's services will be a key part of, of, of the process. Yeah, just from a, from a local level, you know, the, the the engagement with the consultants has been has been really good. They've been really impressed with all the clubs that have uh, engaged with them. So with the playing uh, pitch strategy, it's all broken down into different sports, different age groups, um, whether it be male or female teams. Um, you know, we're very, very lucky that we've got, you know, a great kind of female representation for, you know, your grassroots sports. So all of those clubs and all of that breakdown will be in the in the final strategy document. Yeah. No, that's great. Thank you. I'll just sort of ask the question. Thanks. OK, um, so the recommendations in the report are that the committee endorse the approach outlined in the update uh, and secondly approve the timetable in bringing the strategies to the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee following receipt and processing of the final drafts. Uh, could just get a mover and a seconder, please. Uh, and all in favour? Uh, I'd like to thank officers and um, I think some of you may be staying for the ne next item as well. Uh, but it sounds fantastic and uh, I can't wait to see the, the, the reports when they are completed. Uh, item number 11 is the open spaces update and to receive an update on the open spaces assessment being undertaken by again Knight, Cavender and Page. Um, in attendance are the Executive Director, Organisation and Karen Moss, Sports Development Manager. Yes please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, again, we're in a very similar position with the open spaces assessment as to the previous item. Uh, again, it's been undertaken as part of the work by Knight, Kavanagh and Page uh, and largely linked to, to the local plan. Um, we've just had the draft version of the open spaces assessment. Um, so we've, we've, we've read through it and after an initial appraisal, there's some gaps uh, in provision that we feel that need to be included uh, to give us a greater um, depth of knowledge of, of, of what is available within the area. Part of those are things like the multi-use play areas uh, and the outdoor gym provision and some of the informal spaces haven't been included in the document and they're going to be key to uh, not necessarily from the local plan perspective but in order to gel all three of our strategies, our led strategies together. Um, so the outcomes uh, and adaptations as part of that, you know, have the potential to impact not just on, on the open space assessment, but on, on uh, a couple of the other strategies as well. Uh, and again, we've had no discussions with uh, elected members um, to, to go through the reports. We're still analysing uh, and digesting this report as well. Cheers, thank you. Um, Again, my questions are very similar from from the pre the previous uh, point. Um, I'm guessing when you had your meeting with Lee the other day, you, <laughs> you spoke about this as well. Yeah, I did. I, I briefed um, um, CRC on all the strategies um, and the the kind of impact that they could that could potentially have on on their wellbeing strategy. Uh, and again, you know, once this this the final draft has come through and it's been digested and gone out to the the kind of internal audience, then we will we will share that with with the uh, CRC to formulate part of their strategy. I think as well for me, one encouraging comment was informal open spaces. So so, so although the, the, when people think I live next to an open space, uh, f for one example, uh, I think it's the wreck in Amington. Uh, if you don't live in Amington, you won't know it's there. Um, but, but 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 I think that's going to be the sort of informal open space. Although there is a park on there, but if you didn't know it was there you wouldn't know it's there. Yeah, that's the kind of, you know, spaces that, that, that we're missing. Uh, I think the, the open spaces assessment started being off as quite kind of prescriptive and it wasn't classed as an open space unless it was something like 0.2 hectares, whereas, you know, we've kind of adapted that to be more um, kind of appropriate for the, for the local level and our local need. So, yeah, we'll include those kind of areas. Cheers. Uh, anybody else? 
Um, I think I think a lot like I say, the, a lot of the questions were, were covered in covered in the uh, the previous item. Uh, so the recommendations in the report are that the committee one endorse the approach outlined in the update, uh, two approve the timetable and ringing the strategies to health and wellbeing scrutiny committee until the final drafts have been received and processed. Uh, mover and a seconder. Uh, all in favour. Uh, again, uh, like to thank uh, thank you sir, for coming and uh, for, for the reports, and we totally appreciate the amount of level of work that, that that's going into into these reports. And um, yeah, they're they're, they're going to shape Tamworth for a good few years, few years to come. Uh, thank you. Uh, item number 12 is the public toilet provision in Tamworth. Uh, so earlier I spoke that um, that had gone, uh, been directed to us from full council uh, in relation to a petition which was submitted on the 15th of March 2022. Uh, and at full council it was resolved that the council agree that the Health and Wellbeing Scrutiny Committee take on the issues included in the petition specific to the Castle Grounds. Agreed that the Health and Wellbeing Committee conduct a wider review of the public toilet provision in Tamworth and agreed that recommendations are made to Cabinet at an appropriate time to be included in this year's budget cycle. I'd uh, just like to invite the Assistant Director of Assets to provide an overview and presentation of the current provision. Please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, so, yeah, some time ago I was asked to just provide, I suppose, some information on the current status of the public toilets in Tamworth as we see it. Uh, so I've just prepared a few slides really just to sort of give, I suppose, the where we are now. And then it was really to take your, your questions and views on that and look to work with yourselves to develop, I suppose, that response back to full council uh, on the way forward. So in, in terms of the slides... The first slide really just shows the locations of the current toilet provision, public toilet provision that we see as being public toilets. Uh, Tamworth Assembly Rooms, for those who sort of can recall, a commitment was made at the time when the Tamworth Assembly Rooms was being refurbished that the toilets in the, in the facility would also be usable as public toilets. Uh, they are variable hours based on the opening hours and operations of the assembly rooms uh, and I believe they are closed when there are performances on but they are open sort of during the day when the coffee shop and, and that and that's open. We have the Castle Grounds toilets which I think everyone knows uh, they're operated by us they are I suppose what you consider to be traditional public toilets in the sense that they are a building that hosts a toilet for the public to use as opposed to toilets within other facilities. Uh, they're open seven days a week, nine o'clock till 5 p.m. Uh, and they include a, a special dedicated changing places facility uh, and that sort of meets the changing places standard so it has a full changing bench, uh, hoist and you know the equipment needed for changes, changing places. Uh, the other public toilets that we consider to be public toilets but not in our ownership or management are those in Ankerside. They're operated by Ankerside and the opening hours would be set by Ankerside. Again, my understanding is they are open generally during normal operating hours for the centre, but that's outside of our control, so they're operated as and when the, the centre see fit to operate those. So, so yeah, so the next slide just covers sort of our, how we operate and clean the toilets. Uh, in terms of the Tamworth assembly rooms, as I say, availability is limited to the building's opening hours. Cleaning and stocking is just done as part of the building operations, so they just manage that as part of the just general operations of that building. Uh, clearly, they, they look to maintain a standard over there because they are open for shows and they want, to, you know, that sort of standard that was set when the refurbishment work was done. Uh, the, there's a couple of sets of toilets in there. So there's the there's the toilets adjacent to the coffee shop and then there's the toilets on the other side, uh, male and female toilets with disabled access uh, toilets. Castle grounds, say 9 a.m. 9 till 5 p.m. every day. They're automatic opening and closing, so they've got a, a time control on those. So the they lock and unlock themselves. 
there's limited rest cleaning and restocking during the day. We don't have a full-time resource to do that. Uh, they're all single occupancy to toilets, so it's just one one toilet per room. And uh, there's a few that are properly you know, wheelchair accessible. And then there's the changing places, which is a, a, you know, a totally different type of facility with the hoist and everything else in. Very often the opening hours of the toilets are extended when there are events on, uh, but also I think as ID um, commented on earlier, toilet provision is usually part of the event management as well. So additional toilets are brought in, but more often than not, our toilets are open alongside just to sort of increase that capacity. Uh, and I think you know, it's probably fair to say our toilets are generally preferred uh, to the porter, the portaloo types that you, you'll see. Next slide. So one of the questions that came back was usage uh, statistics on the toilet. And unfortunately, it's something we don't have. Uh, there's no monitoring equipment installed on them to sort of uh, count who comes and who goes. Uh, we do have anecdotal information based on sort of customer feedback over the years and just general observation that busy periods still remain, weekends, uh, school holidays, we know that weather has an impact so you know weekends and school holidays in particular when the weather's good there's a lot of people in the castle grounds uh school holidays will always be busier because people bring children to the, the castle grounds and similarly weekends people you know free time uh, if they're not working again come to the castle grounds we also know that the toilets are heavily used when events are taking place in the castle grounds uh, and whilst additional toilets are bought in, ours still still get used and sort of you know they're still uh, operational through those events. In 2013, uh, when we had the original toilets, the opening hours were actually adjusted and became seasonal. They used to be sort of open, sort of more sort of a, a year-round arrangement, but. We were we identified because at the time we had attendants in the toilets that actually they were seeing very little usage uh, through those winter periods uh, and particularly weekdays in the winter, uh, other than potentially sort of the, I suppose the early holiday around October time, uh, school holidays in the week they were getting used, but sort of for the most part Monday to Friday in the winter they just weren't being used much, uh, and as a result what we did is we looked at the I looked at the operating hours and really we limited them during the autumn and winter periods to school holidays and weekends and whilst when that initially happened I think there was sort of you know some some negative feedback it didn't really continue uh, because I suspect in reality we had people on the ground at the time sort of operating the toilets and they knew that there wasn't much usage during that time uh, and that was probably you know reflected back in the uh, you know sort of the feedback from residents 2018 castle grounds were refurbished to give us those single occupancy units and the change in place facility uh, i mean part of the reason for that the old the toilets that were there were in you know they were old they were end of life uh, the view was that the single occupancy toilets whilst there are fewer of them in theory should suffer less from vandalism because you don't get people congregating in there, uh, which again, you know, it wasn't uncommon for low level vandalism to take place in the toilets. Usually, you know, I suppose uh, younger people, you know, just stuffing toilet paper into sinks and flooding the place, which, you know, it, it just ends up shutting the building down whilst they do maintenance. So it took the facilities out of action more frequently. We have still had vandalism, as you'd expect. It's in a public place, and it's you know the doors are always locked when you're in there, so people don't know what's going on. Uh, but I think it's probably fair to say it hasn't been as bad as it used to be because people it's limited to a facility, and also you don't know who's waiting outside to come in. And if you know someone's gone in and used the toilet and then come out and it's completely trashed, it sort of starts to become obvious who might have done it. So you know it's more likely to get reported. Uh, so, you know, it, it has had its advantages. Changing place facilities, I don't think is used that frequently, uh, from my understanding of it. 
again, it's one of those, because of the nature of that room, it needs two people because someone has to operate the hoist for the disabled person. It's, you know, it, it's for people who have severe mobility issues. Uh, so it, it doesn't get a massive amount of use, but it's there if people need it. And I know people have used it because we've had comments from people who've used it. So, you know, and it's, it's well, you know, it's, it, it's, it's well needed. Uh, and again, I think it's, you know, it's, it's one of those. It's a good facility to have for those who do need it. It's probably, I'm sure it's appreciated by those who do need it. Uh, but it, it's something that wouldn't be used frequently. We try to limit the use of that. Uh, to those people who really do need it because of the expensive equipment in there and if it's not used properly then you end up with the hoist sort of running out of battery power battery back up and that doesn't work and you know there's, there's potential for people to injure themselves if they don't use the hoist properly uh, so it's, it really does need to be people who know know how to use the facility there used to be Public convenience is located on Corporation Street by the Philip Dick Centre, the tech building now. Uh, those were demolished. There were also toilets on Spinning School Lane. Now, I think those were probably demolished about 20 years ago. Uh, presumably, I mean, I wasn't, wasn't here at the time, so presumably that was because they weren't particularly well used. Uh, but that those were those were taken out of use, and those are the only public toilets I'm aware of in Tamworth. I know there used to be some underneath the town hall many years ago, but I don't couldn't find any details as to when those were decommissioned. Uh, so I'm not I'm not sure when those were taken out of action. In terms of cleaning and repairs, uh, we have our own in-house directly employed staff. We only have limited resources for cleaning. The public toilets so they generally are done on a calling basis i think we have uh, i think it's about seven hours a week allocated to cleaning toilets so it's very limited in, in terms of uh, availability of staff we have looked at alternative methods of operating the toilets but no real interest in it uh, largely because it's small scale it's one it's one site in tamworth in the park so it's not an easy location to get to in a vehicle uh, and there's really just no money in it in terms of sort of doing doing it as a, a one-off we also have difficulties recruiting staff to do toilet cleaning in particular weekend and hol bank holiday toilet cleaning uh, because it's just not you know it, it's a job people don't want to really do by the sounds of it you know we've, we've explored it uh, we used to have access to uh, Companies would provide agency cleaners, and even they are struggling now to find staff who want to do that type of work. Uh, you know, I mean, anecdotally, a colleague of mine sort of tried to uh, get agency staff for one of the weekends in the summer, and the agency manager said, it "Doesn't really matter how much you're offering me, I just haven't got the people to send to you." So you know, it's it, it was a, a, that sort of you know that sort of level of uh, interest in the, in that type of work. Any repair works that we do are carried out by our sort of main contractor equines. As I say, tends to be low level vandalism that we see in there, you know, people just sort of you know, causing sort of minor damage. Uh, I don't think there's anything being significant gone on in there, but you know, that, and that, I, I don't see that change. I think that's something that you'll always get on, on public toilets just because, you know, they are what they are in the middle of the town, you know, sort of the castle grounds. Uh, and I, you know, I just don't think you're going to get around that one. We had looked at increasing cleansing hours, uh, but unfortunately, that was seen as being cost, cost prohibitive, uh, and didn't go through in the end. One of the other things I was asked to look at is whether there are alternative options and alternative toilet provision. Uh, conscious of the fact that the castle grounds toilets don't really provide a practical solution to night the nighttime economy. Uh, it's the castle grounds, it's dark, it's a little bit out of the way, I suppose, really, for people coming into town at night, uh, you know, particularly during those darker, dark nights. Uh, you're unlikely to want to walk down to the castle grounds to use the toilet if you've come out of one of the uh, venues in the town centre. Uh, and I think, you know, so one, one of the comments was around sort of having facilities in and around the town. 
highly unlikely that we'd want to put our own public toilets in because I think we'd struggle to operate them. Uh, we struggle now to recruit staff to operate toilets. So operating sort of toilets in the town centre or another set of toilets would probably be quite difficult. There are uh, community toilet schemes in place and some local authorities do sign up to that. And essentially what that does is it actually works with local businesses uh, to make their facilities available for use by the general public. There's a mechanism where the local authority may provide some financial support for that, but the local authority also uh, carries out checks to make sure that the facilities are reasonable, usable, usable accessible, and that uh, when they've been operated, the general public can use them, and it's not a case of people being turned away because they're not customers. Anyone signing up, up to this, uh, these schemes has to be able to say it's open for the public whether you're a customer or not. I, I, you know, whilst the local authority provides some support to them, I suspect where they're actually looking at is that if you do come in, whilst you're not obliged to use uh, use their facility, pay for you know services or goods in their store, people perhaps do. And if it encourages you into the store and through, you know, through the store, you might see something in there and sort of you know be, become a custom a paying customer for them. So you know, there's probably benefits there for the you know the businesses as well. So really, that's. That's all I've got at this stage in terms of sort of where we are, the facilities we have, uh, and potentials for alternative provision. So really, as I suppose it was down to you know throw it back to yourselves as to what what you actually wanted now from us uh, in terms of further information or suggestions, proposals. Joe, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Plymouth. On the changing places, um, you may have mentioned it, but I can't remember if you did. What are the opening times for that? So the published opening times are the same as the public toilets. So they're 9am to 5pm. It's, it's a facility where you have to use an intercom system to gain access. So there's technically no reason why that can't be used because it goes through to the CCTV control centre combined authority. Uh, as I say, at the moment it's that nine to five, largely because it allows us. If we do need to go in and clean it, we can. If we need to maintain, we can. If there's anyone trapped in there, which I suppose could happen, again, you know, during during those working hours, it means we could get someone out to them fairly quickly. Whereas if it was out of hours, much more difficult. But it could be made available if needed. Can I go back on that then? Um, is there a way that the um, committee can um, put forward a recommendation to explore that? Um, I understand the reason why you're saying it possibly wouldn't be ideal because if it needed cleaning, you know, but surely we've got people who are 24-7 working. Um, we can get somebody out to clean it if necessary. I'm just thinking if somebody, you know, requires that facility, which is very specific, and also changing places brings people into the town because there's a specific facility for them. Um, it seems that we're, we're not providing a full service to these people, and I'd like it explored whether we could have that, um, have that intercom system um, published as part of the change in places facility that we have. Just to clarify, so, so if if somebody who needed the change in places facility went went there at six o'clock on the evening and pressed the intercom, they could still access it. There's no reason why they shouldn't be able to. The the CA pick up the contact for it, and they should be able to let someone in because it still operates. It's it's separate it's separate to the timers on the main toilets. I'm not aware that that's ever happened, but whether that's because the published hours are nine to five and people just assume it's going to be closed. I don't know, uh, but it, because it goes through the, the through to the CCTV control centre, there's no reason why they wouldn't be able to open it. And the the, the operators of CCTV will, will they understand that 
that that facility is there and it can be accessed past the time. I'm, that... I'm not sure. I'd have to check that one. Yeah. Uh, just to see what they what they'd actually say on it. Council Woodrup. If people are looking at using it outside of the hours, for example, you'd have to have in a, a robust health and safety check, wouldn't you? Because obviously, if you're letting somebody in, it's then the control centre's responsibility or somebody to make sure that that person's left and not locked in. I think that there's a big piece of work that would have to be done around this and you'd need to look at, you know, you'd need to do a bit of a feasibility study, wouldn't you, really, to make sure that it is viable because... You know, you don't want somebody in there all night, and then the next thing you get is saying that I've been left on my own all night. No, but you, so, so I think there's a massive piece of work that would need to be done, and you'd need to look at, you know, as I said, to do a, a sort of feasibility study on whether that would be viable or not. Thank you. Uh, uh, just to clarify that again, so, so the if somebody's going in there to use the the changing facility. It, more likely than not, they'd be with another person, wouldn't they? Uh, effectively, it needs two people because the hoist has to be operated by someone. So if a person who needed that needed the hoist, which is essentially what the changing places facility is for, so it's got all of that changing bed in there, then clearly they, a person on their own wouldn't be able to use the hoist to put themselves on the changing bed and change themselves. It's it's going, it's almost certainly going to be someone else assisting them in there, uh, because I don't I don't know if you'd be able to do it safely otherwise. I mean I, I could be completely wrong in terms of that. There may be some people who can, but that generally seems to be the way they work. And in terms of if they're in there and somebody gets stuck stuck in there, presuming there's a panic button or something inside it, where does that go to? Does that go to CCTV? I'm sure that one goes to the CCTV as well. Yeah. But there's, I don't think there's an intercom inside. I think it is just a panic alarm. Okay. So, in, just want, I just want to dig a bit deeper in this. So, be it day or night, the response would still be the same, wouldn't it? From a panic button inside. Y yes and no. I mean, during the daytime, we have people available who are actually working in the area so street scene, for example, are on site. They, they, most days, they will be in the castle grounds doing some work, so someone could be deployed quickly. Outside of normal working hours, while someone could be deployed, it wouldn't necessarily be quickly. It would be a longer response time. So, yes, it would get picked up. Yes, someone could be contacted, but it wouldn't be the same level of response out of hours because we just don't have people on the ground 24-7, you know, it's, they, they are on a call-out basis, so they'd have to be called out to it. Well, it, 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 to me, if, if, if somebody hits a panic button inside the room, nobody knows what's going on inside that room, and are you saying that CCTV are going to phone up street scene to go and knock on the door? They, they'd have to deploy someone to it, yeah. I mean, ultimately, someone would have to physically go to site to to interact on site because ultimately we don't they're not attending toilets so there's no one permanently on site down there uh you know they're they're, they're not an attended toilet so someone would have to physically go out to that toilet on the panic alarm yeah now so like i say so during working hours there will be someone more local available outside of working hours not necessarily because people you know people live in various places uh not necessarily in immediately in the town so if they're on call out of hours it may be a little bit longer to get someone out to them uh, even if we called a repairs contractor for example they're still on a couple of hours response time out of hours they're not immediate uh, uh, no but, but but i understand that but but if somebody's hitting a panic button inside a disabled facility i don't think it's going to be a locked door so my concern is that, that CCTV are ringing up street scene when a more appropriate professional should be attending them toilets. The, the reality of it is we don't have anyone on site and that's, that's, you know, that, that's the situation there. So who do they call? Because the, the, you know, the emergency service won't generally attend unless someone has confirmed that it's an emergency. Now, a panic alarm could be... I mean, we've had them where people just go, I can't get out the door. And when you turn up, it's just they haven't used the handle properly. 
we, in fact, we had one of the doors where someone broke the door, uh, a member of the public broke the door, because they said the lock wasn't working properly, and actually it was, they just didn't use it properly. Uh, so, you know, I don't think the emergency services would attend in that situation unless it was a confirmed, if someone, if someone phoned in, so if someone was in the toilet and they phoned and said, look, this, the person I'm with is having a, a medical emergency, well, to be honest with you, they'd probably just phone the emergency service straight away, wouldn't they? They wouldn't bother pressing the panic button. The panic button's generally going to be used more if someone gets locked in, I would have thought. Has it ever been looked at to have the intercom put in solid as well? It, it's not something we looked at, no. Not in that particular one, because like I say, it is effectively expected that two people would be in there. So you'd have the disabled person and the person who was caring for them in there. Councillor. Yeah, that would need to be put in for the eight of hours one because hypothetically, say if the carer had an accident mm -hmm. and the person's in the hoist, I'm just saying it's a, mm -hmm. we need to look at it as a bigger you know as a bigger picture. And it may never happen, but then it may happen. So I think we need to look mm -hmm. at you know, it's a it, as I said, it, it, it's a bit of a big piece of work that would need to be done rather than just making a decision. And how often would it be used or? You know, I don't know. Councillor Jack. Quick question. Obviously, uh, you shouldn't just look at things from a legal perspective, but legally, is it the council's resp responsibility? Surely people have their own responsibility when they're going in there. Okay, they're disabled with a carer. Surely that's their responsibility and of not putting all this in place with, you know, intercoms and staff and whatever when the, surely it's the carer's responsibility, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, of course, as the operator of the toilets, we're obliged to ensure that they are safe to use. So the facilities have to be checked. They have to be safe. The hoist has to be serviced regularly. Uh, and we have to check that everything's operating properly. But we aren't the users, and we effectively allow people into the building to use the facilities with the expectation that they know how to use the facilities and use them properly. Uh, within the... Changing places, there is an operations card in there, if you like, that sort of gives the specific operations for the hoist. But what we could never do is a risk assessment for someone that says, in your particular case, this is how you manually handle a person from a wheelchair into the hoist and onto the bed. Because that is going to be different depending on who the person is and what their disability is. Uh, so that's, that's a piece of work that very often sort of in a home the occupational therapist does so they they work with uh, carers to teach them how to manually handle someone through that pro transition process and back again that's something we could never do because th there's so many different people could come through that door we could never account for every single one and who would instruct them uh, you know so it is very much i suppose at user risk to some degree but accepting that you know things like entrapments for example would be our responsibility so if someone gets locked in because the door fails then clearly yes that sits with us because they're trapped in a building because the door has failed uh, so there's an, you know there's, there's an element there that yes we have to uh, do something but at the same time like I say we can't be entirely responsible for how people are using the facility uh, and we don't do the risk assessments in terms of their you know general usage of the facility so then the panic alarm sounds proportionate to what our responsibility is, which is just if the lock doesn't work, essentially. I mean, ultimately, yes, I suppose, is, you know, that, that's, that, to my mind, is where the panic alarm comes into its own. In, you know, in a lot of toilets, it's, it, perhaps if someone's fallen, you know, the panic alarm goes off and someone comes to them. The problem with any panic alarm is if it's there, there's an expectation that someone is going to attend quickly to deal with the situation. And it's probably worse to have a panic alarm that isn't going to be attended to quickly than to not have one at all. Uh, because, like I say, you, you're setting up that expectation, and if you can't fulfil it, then people are going to be sitting there saying, I've been, I've, I was pressing the panic button constantly, and I was there for four hours on the floor, and no one came. Uh, so... I think the, the panic alarm, in, particularly in the changing places toilet, probably is 
proportionate to the situation simply because generally it should be two people going in there and the care act should understand how all the equipment works uh, and how they actually deal with sort of transferring sort of the person they're caring for. Uh, Council Cook. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for that. There was other questions I had, but they've literally almost kind of been answered. Interesting though, is this issue with the uh, panic alarm and that. What would it, um, cost us to have a look into sticking the intercom in there on the basis of, although it may not happen, we, we might have a situation where there's an accident in there and the carers uh, uh, phone kind of breaks or anything like that. If they access the panic alarm, which then activates that intercom, then there's the option then to tell a person, oh, this has happened, this has happened, can we have this uh, help or something? Obviously with the um, panic alarm in any way, it literally may not ever happen. But if there is a case where an accident in there does happen and that, at least we have that extra uh, ability to know that we have to contact either the uh, police or something like that and it's not just the actual uh, repairs or something. Thank you. To hand, I don't know how much it would cost, I mean, but it's something that's easy enough to, to go back to our contractors and sort of get that priced up. Uh, the line's already there through to CCTV anyway, so presumably we just sort of tap into the same telephone line, so there probably shouldn't be any additional cost for that, so it is, would just be the, the intercom system. Uh, I mean, uh, proportionally, I don't suppose it'd be that expensive uh, to install. Uh, so, but we can certainly get costings on it fairly, fairly easy. Uh, do you want to come back on that? Or no, uh, Councillor Smith, and then Councillor Jai, and then just to clarify definitions here. Um, so you got the panic alarm, you got the intercom. Um, so if you press the panic button, it, it will happen. That does, does that go to the intercom, through the intercom, or what actually goes to this control room or this person? My understanding of it is, and I'd have to clarify this one, is that the, the intercom is on the outside, and that's effectively, you use that to request access, and they allow, uh, CCTV then would allow you in. Uh, the panic alarm, as I understand it, just goes through to the call center at CCTV, but it's just it would come up as just panic alarm press, similar to most of the panic alarms we have in say Marmion House and other buildings. So it's it's a non-specific uh, call. It just says the panic alarm has gone off, and I think there's probably a light on the outside as well that tells you the panic alarm's gone off. I'd have to check that one. There usually is on most of these panic alarms. It's just got the the red light on the outside, so you know that's where the alarm's gone off. Just slightly off that particular topic now. Um, so it went from agency staff to in-house. Uh, what was the reason for that? And are there any clear benefits? Uh, no, it's, it's, it's always been in-house. We used to have uh, toilet attendants many years ago uh, in the old toilets down here and the ones up at uh, Corporation Street. The we went to reduced hours, but it's still our own staff cleaning and always was was, was our own staff. Uh, we do use agency from time to time. That's more just to sort of backfill for our own staff when we've got absences. And like I say, we do struggle with covering weekends and evening, uh, weekends and bank holidays because people don't want to work those. Uh, so we do have to sometimes resort to agencies for those, but that's more about cover. 
Yeah, and also just to clarify, um, you said the total cleaning at the moment is seven hours a week. Is that an average or is that at particular seasons or times of the year? Es essentially, that's the number of hours allocated to cleaning for that facility year round uh, because it's open now nine to five, seven days a week. So it's we, we don't know when it's going to necessarily be used. If there's events going on, even in the winter, it could still be used. So those are the hours that are allocated to it. Uh, and those are the hours that we allocate staff to it. So that's, that's seven hours a week total. Yeah. Okay. Not a question, but I thought that was quite low, personally. I was quite surprised by that. Uh, I um, tend to agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is low, but that's, yeah. that's the budget all allocation we have for it. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Joe. Thank you. Just um, two points. One, you mentioned about the nighttime economy and the public toilets. I think that's a bit of a moot point because surely people would go in where they've just been. If you're, if you're in a pub, a bar, a nightclub, you'd, you'd go there, right? You wouldn't go out searching for a public toilet. You think so, but I. Okay, thanks. So, what I was going to say was, um, we you talked about the so the toilets are open fifty six hours a week, and there's seven hours of cleaning allocated a week. Is that right? And you mentioned that sometimes we don't have cover because it's difficult to recruit people. It's difficult to get agencies. I don't think we should just accept that as an answer. I don't mean to put you on the spot here, but you know, just to say, well, the agencies have said this, so therefore it is. Um, I run a recruitment firm and we regularly get work from companies where other agencies have not been able to fill it, right? Because it's, an e it's just an easy answer. So rather than shrug our shoulders and go, oh, we can't do it, I think we should think outside the box and try and do it, even if that costs more money. Um, I went there recently with my two daughters. It's a free, the castle ground playground is a free facility for families. We want to keep it that way. People love coming to it. We just refurbed it. But the toilets were disgusting. We couldn't even use them. They were so bad. We had to go home, we didn't use them, we went, well, we went somewhere over towards Ventura Way, went and bought something and used the toilet. Right, and then we didn't go back there. So they got kids upset, they were having a good time in the park, got a four-year-old, she can't just, you know, be told to hold it. They were disgusting. And that was on a weekend, that was on a Saturday when, you know, many, many people are using it. And people are going to see that and see other things that go on around the castle ground and just think, well, I'm probably not going to come back. You know, I live here, I'm a councillor here, and I would consider thinking, well, Maybe we shouldn't go there. Um, so I don't think we should accept that, that we can't get people to do weekends, and that's what an agency said. We need to think outside the box, even if that costs more money. We're either going to provide a free playground with the right facilities, or we're not. But I don't think we should just, uh, just accept that as an answer. My only response to that is we have a budget allocation of seven hours per, per week at a certain rate of pay. So whilst I take on board your comments on that, if we were to look to either look to recruit our own staff at a higher hourly rate or look to use agencies at a higher hourly rate, then more than happy to investigate that, but we need to find the budget from somewhere for it, uh, which you know it, it's not there at the moment. So we don't have that budget. So we'd have to try and allocate budget from somewhere for it. We should, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. So we shouldn't just go, well, there's no budget for it, so we'll just leave it and then have people have an awful time in our town. We, we, sh we should propose it, we should do something about it. This committee is here to talk about this. It came here for a reason, it's had a petition. Other people have raised it. We should do something about it and not just go, well, there isn't the budget. Sorry, we'll find it. We can find it for other things. I mean, I totally agree with you, Councillor Jay. We actually put a budget proposal in for this year uh, through the budget setting process for effectively 37 hours a week cleaning, which is 
pretty much would have allowed us full-time cleaning. Unfortunately, it was removed from the budget process. Uh, so we didn't get the budget for it, I'm afraid. So that's, it's left us where we are with the seven hours we had got. Councillor Claymore. That seven hours, is it spread across the whole of the week? Is it an hour per day? As a general rule, yes, it would be. Again, simply because of the way we have to allocate time for the staff that we've got. Does that include weekends? Where possible, but again, we do struggle with covering weekends because our own staff aren't contracted for which weekends. Is, yeah, which is the main time that yep. families are going to be using and wanting to use those facilities. And I can only totally agree with Councillor Jay that we don't accept that seven hours is acceptable. Um, I, I don't know how we get it back to Cabinet, but to throw out 37 hours and put it down to seven seems a, a disgrace and not not acceptable for the residents, I'm afraid. Councillor Woodrup. Yeah, and I must agree with what Councillor Jay has said at the end of the day. You know, um, if you're going out there, you, you know, you're taking your families and we're supposed to have pride. It's not, this isn't down to you. This is obviously budget that we need to find out, you know, where we go from here. You know, we should be taking pride in our town and, you know, and toilets are an essential part of day-to-day -day life. And if they have left unkempt, people aren't going to have respect for them either, are they? So it does lead to... People will look at vans, you know, but you don't care about them, so I don't care. You know, so I think we do need to look at it. And hygiene, you know, especially, you know, it should be more, you know, more important since COVID, you know, it's, you know, COVID is, is, is rife again, isn't it? It's rising, you know, cases are rising, people are getting poorly, you know, and I think, you know, hygiene is an essential part of daily life as well, you know. So I think we do need as a committee to look at, how we do that and how do we get the, the budget back and I must also agree with Councillor Jai that you know with recruitment um, I understand for some people it might be the, where it is you know do people live in the area if people live out the area it's the travelling time to and, to and from here but we do need to look at how we recruit and what you know, who are we targeting and how do we target for recruitment and you know the, Mikey, that you know, Tamworth is a you know a brilliant authority to work for, regardless. You know, so I think that's something else that we need to look at, and that's all I can say on that matter, really. Councillor Smith, and then Councillor Climber. Oh, you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I'm assuming the hours that currently can be f afforded are less than last year because I'm sure it was last year, last summer. Um, it felt like there was always a presence. Um, maybe it was more the year before, but it felt like there was always a cleaner down there. And I was really, you know, proud to have that kind of facility. Um, so, yeah, so has it come down is the question. Um, and, yeah, can we not increase it? Can we recommend that, maybe? Yeah, that, no, thanks for that. In terms of the cleaning hours, certainly during the COVID period, when we were open, there were additional hours allocated through that COVID funding uh, to do additional cleaning and also supervision and management of the queues. But that was, again, part of that wider response to COVID. Uh, so it was outside, effectively, the normal routine cleaning, uh, and it was allocated specifically for that reason. I think when everything was stood down, then we went back to sort of the normal allocated uh, cleaning hours. I mean, in terms of recommendations, as I say, I'm more than happy to put those proposals forward in terms of what the cost would be, but clearly it's within the hands of members to, to look at those budgets and approve. In terms of recruitment, you know, it is a minimum wage job, unfortunately, which isn't particularly attractive to people very often, uh, or certainly doesn't seem to be. So, you know, we can make every effort to try and recruit, but it, I, we can't force people to take uh, that type of work because I, I just 
which we, we, we struggle in general with cleaning, not just toilet cleaning, uh, just across the board cleaning is something that you know we struggle to recruit into, and people don't very, lack, people tend not to stay very long. Uh, but if I just quickly come back on that, is um, I'm just wondering whether it's the logistics really because. I mean, in my experience, you know, where I work, you know, it's huge, quite a sizable company come in and do the cleaning. They're contracted. But I guess, you know, it works for them because there's a huge amount of cleaning. We've probably, they've probably paid a lot of money. So <clears throat> is it more like that agencies or additional staff logistically, it, you're going to get that more if you are willing to spend provide more hours of cleaning essentially because if at the moment if it's only seven hours a week then from an agency point of view that might be like well is it worth it you know um sort of having that agreement but certainly i, I think that it should be pretty much full time you know if it was 35 hours before i think it should be 35 hours and then that might attract you know a, a full time whether it be in-house or agency i mean in, in terms of the staff we have they aren't just working seven hours a week for us. They would be doing other jobs to make up additional hours. So they, they, most, most of our cleaners have more than one job with us. So their hours on each individual job is, can be quite small hours, but over the, the bulk of what they do, it makes up the, sort of the hours that they're looking for. Uh, so it's, it's not just seven hours because that I, I think we'd struggle to get anyone who just want to work seven hours a week. It's you know it's not practical. Uh, but like I say, you know, in terms of sort of the way they work, the same person might be going and cleaning the castle for a number of hours, or the or the assembly rooms for a number of hours. So they're not just doing seven hours a week for us. Uh, but like I say, yeah, and with agency, it probably is more a case of if all we want is someone to come and clean the castle grounds toilets for an hour. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to come perhaps spend an hour a day but split over two or three visits it probably isn't practical councillor jai then councillor wadrup and then councillor cook yes i think p part of the problem is just viewing it how you mentioned there i'm sorry you're the one on the spot but you're the officer here right i think though well it is a it is a minimum wage job for example it's not if you're going on, on saturday it's not a minimum wage job so that's the first thing that that mentality should change if you're going to get people in there's lots of ways to do it you could say right on a saturday it's open for eight hours probably the first two hours maybe you don't need someone because it's quieter maybe six hours a day maybe the last hour you don't need someone i don't know if you said someone you know come in 11 till 2 but i'll pay you till four or something or pay you x you know people would do that so if you split it down if you just say to someone you want to come and work nine to five cleaning a toilet on a saturday probably going to say here no for minimum wage you said someone come do three hours for you know, six hours pay or something, you'll probably get it. But it's not going to come from someone who's doing seven hours for us on this and five other jobs for us. They're not going to do it. It needs to be someone someone else specifically for that. There's, there's plenty of ways to to get someone. Um, there's probably even like local, you know, you've got the, the bowling alley down there, sort of that. they've probably got cleaners. You could probably pay them and say, give them extra or something or do something with them that they can come down a few hours at certain times of day. There's always a way of doing it. Um, and if we're trying to get someone that's doing 35 hours for us out, you know, throughout the, the council and just seven hours and that, they're definitely not going to want to come and do weekends. So I get that. That's why we need to move away from that and just see it as a service we need to provide, particularly at a weekend. You probably need six hours a day, Saturday and Sunday, and find a way of doing it. Councillor Woodrup. Yeah, just a quick one. Although you're saying minimum wage, shouldn't it be a living wage? Because that would entice people more. Because obviously, you know, um, it's that's how it should be, really. Living wage, not minimum wage. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I mean, it probably is higher than minimum wage, but it's about the the lowest sort of scale that the council offers. Uh, so again, whilst. You know, I could I could tell you anything today in terms of you know yeah if you want to pay someone fifty thousand pound a year and they'll come and clean your toilets you may get someone for that but that's not for me to make that decision we have a grading structure those jobs are being graded within that pay range that's the salary that's offered for it and we have a pay policy that sits around it so anything around that would also have to we'd also have to look at our pay policy and how we pay staff and how we grade staff. 
and you know, going back to Councillor Jay's comments about paying six hours for three hours' work, that again we'd have to look at how that would fit with our pay structure and everything else. So it goes wider than just looking at this in isolation. Uh, you know, we'd have to look at sort of that wider sort of pay and pay terms and conditions arrangements for it. Nothing's impossible, but it's not something that I don't think you could look at it just in isolation for this. It's got to take that wider aspect into account. Yeah, no, I think it does. And I think that's something that us as elected members need to look at is a living wage for the employees rather than a minimum wage. Other authorities do it. Councillor Cook. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you for that. So, in hindsight, we have this uh, challenge of we actually swan those extra hours of uh, uh, cleaning, etc., but we've not got the actual. Uh, budget there for it. So if we added the extra budget, then it would be possible. Would we be able to recommend that the way I kind of see it, we, we have the toilets there, we have the, all the extra sort of leisure facilities in that area, and that's what we kind of want to uh, promote in our area anyway. So would it be possible to put a recommendation into Cabinet that they have a look at their extra projects within our verse, verse sports and uh, leisure areas and have a look if we can gather the extra funding out of that as it would all technically um, come and To the same area anyway. Thank you. I mean, to be fair, saying that you've you've just explored another question for me with the the events that are open. Are the toilets still being cleaned for seven hours? They would be cleaned by. Um, after listening to everyone and, and, and the officer, I've, I've brought a couple of recommendations that I'll just put out there <coughs> to see if we can move them all on bulk, uh, as not to sometimes hear their votes left, right and centre. Councillor Kaimo. Sorry, Chair, I, I had got another point. Are we just talking about the toilets now, the recommendation for the cleaning, or are we exploring other things now? Toilets in general. Toilet, because I have got another question. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, um, the community toilet scheme, have we looked at that at all? Have we explored that in any shape or form? It's been no, no formal... Uh investigation into that one beyond sort of knowing that the scheme is out there uh, and available but we've not been engaged to sort of open those discussions uh, 
so it's something that we'd have to have, I suppose, almost some sort of governance in place to open those discussions and allow it to happen. Yeah, I mean, I know initially this came to health and wellbeing because of the petition with the opening times, but it's obviously, you know, mushroomed out now. And we can see that, well, for me, I can see that the facilities are so inadequate and the provision that we're providing is so inadequate that I think it, it's almost um, important that we go back to Cabinet and try and get some extra hours and in, explore some of these other possibilities. Um, yeah, so... So, uh, so there's... I've put down four recommendations and we might have to have a little discussion about wording. Uh, but So recommendation one would be for Cabinet to explore, explore using contingency to fund cleaner for toilets, castle ground. Number two, Cabinet to explore with officers, uh, what was it, the community scheme? I've just, I've... Yeah. So cabinet, cabinet explore with officers uh, community scheme uh, with businesses. Uh, number three, for cabinet to con uh, continue with officers with the seven days opening, but with a possibility for in the summer to be extended to seven o'clock. 1900 hours and number four explore pricing of intercom in changing facility can I get a seconder <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, debate of a pink uh, number one was uh, cabinet explore using contingency to fund clean out for toilets in brackets castle ground. I'd probably have something a bit more specific in that because you basically want more um, resources. I'm not sure whether that absolutely nails it. You know, more hours basically. I think what what the officer was saying was that that with with the added budget, them hours will will be extended. I'll just get clarification on that. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, as a general rule, I think what what we'd be looking at on this is if the recommendation was to fund to adequately fund the cleaning of the castle grounds, that would result in a paper that sort of says to adequately resource it based on the operating hours that we operate at the moment and also to operate the extended summer hours if that was approved this is what it would cost and this is what we would have to look look at so it's, it's more around sort of allocating those adequate resources to it because i think the paper that would follow from that is setting out what that would look like okay so number one would be for cabinet to allocate resources for the exploration for further funding funding for the castle ground toilets including extra opening hours summer opening hours with exploration of addition of intercom council climber Oh, it's gone now. I've lost it. <laughs> oh, yes, I was going to say, could we put something specific in there to include cleaning at weekends, which is the, is the main time when we've got people using it? Yeah, weekend and bank holidays. So what I wrote down for the first one was for Cabinet to 
allocate sufficient resources from um, the contingency funding to uh, no for cabinet to um, explore the allocation of a dis a, to, for cabinet to explore the allocation of further ad adequately resourcing um, the cleaning at the castle grounds using contingency funding including ensuring there's adequate cleaning at weekends and holidays times not quite <laughs> Could you specify that it's the toilets it's the castle grounds <laughs> i was just going to also say um i think councillor claymore was saying that essentially you want to try and say that a higher proportion of the resources through the week are attained on the weekend. So I think it sort of needs to, yeah. <laughs> well, basically we're all along the same lines there, aren't we? So, so more resource, more hours for cleaning, and foc focused cleaning, yeah. additional summer hours, and the exploration of an intercom in the... Yeah, yeah those were other recommendations that we'd... Yeah, as well as that first one, yeah. just nailing that first one. Yeah. So, move by... No. Seconded by. <laughs> and all in favour? Yep. So further from that, I think I think I just need to clarify about someone. Um going back to full council. We're just the, we've, um, missed, we've missed that one. No, yeah. Uh, so uh, the recommendation has been moved, and I'd like to uh, thank the officer for his time uh, and presentation and uh, conversation with us. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, uh, agenda item number 13 is uh, forward plan. Uh, has anybody seen anything? Uh, uh, I mean, we're, we're coming up to the end of the municipal year. We've got a, a meeting next uh, in two weeks' time. Single item agenda, um, which we'll go through a little bit more in a minute. Um, item 14 is the working group updates. Uh, we've just done toilets provision, so that's that's uh, gone there. Armed Forces Covenant, so the Borough Council and the County Council signed a new uh, Armed Forces Covenant. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think that's that's been dealt with. Uh, migrant travelling community work and briefings are ongoing. Um, so so um, there was a members briefing uh, the other week um so sadly i missed uh, due to other other commitments but i've been informed that it was quite a constructive uh meeting um i understand that members have had uh the new policy uh, and framework circulated to them so hopefully that's going to give a better understanding for all um Agenda item 15, health and wellbeing scrutiny work plan. Uh, so again, we're, we're coming up to the end of the year. I think we've we've managed to tick quite a few things off, but uh, one major piece of work is going to be the healthy communities report that was sent down to us from county. Um, so that's going to be a single item uh, meeting next time round uh mental health well-being support for council staff yeah 
So, um, again, I've, I've been having further uh, looks at what could be available to councillors, more, looking more at councillors here, because um, staff is being dealt with by their own policy. Um, but I feel that I can't really go into depth of like pricings and that because it, 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 it's commercial sensitivity. But but what I would say is for a low amount of money, the same sort of offer could be afforded to members and it wouldn't be classed as a benefit in kind. So it, 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 it wouldn't incur, incur um, as much as it would do and incorporate as much as it would do with staff but to recommend to cabinet that they explore the options for member be member benefit scheme in relation to mental health and well-being support so it, it, it wouldn't that that'd be the end of the recommendation uh, but it, so it wouldn't incorporate other benefits that employee employees get, but it'd be targeted. It'd be like a an app on your phone um, for, for well being, mental health, uh, and then you'd have access to a helpline or or anything. Because uh, as I'm sure a lot of us are aware that as well as our, our own lives, we also come in contact with some uh, casework that that might be delicate. And affect us, and I think that w w we should be given the same opportunity of support that staff staff are basically. Uh, so, could I get a second for that recommendation? Yeah. yeah. Uh, all in favour? Yeah. Uh, and so the draft annual report will be out for next week's. Two weeks times agenda. Eighteenth, uh, eighteenth. So just a little bit longer than the than two weeks. Uh, was that three weeks? Two, three, three weeks. It's been a long meeting. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'd like to. Unless anybody else has got any more questions or comments, I'd like to close the meeting at twenty o two. Thank you very much.